thank you for joining us. There is one party in the conference. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much for joining Zion Church, Zion Church Tuesday night Bible study via Facebook Live. I see there are a couple of people um, chiming in. Um, do me a favor. Um, as you come in, please introduce yourself. Let me know that you're here and that you can see and hear me clearly. I just want to make sure that um, I can be seen and heard clearly. Please let me know. Thank you. Also, do me another favor while you're on here. Go ahead and share this uh, Bible study tonight. Go ahead and share um, uh, to your timeline. Let, uh, let other people know that Zion Church is in Bible study tonight um, so that we can get the word out about our lesson tonight. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. We'll go ahead and get started in just a few here. Praise the Lord, First Lady Deary. Thank you for confirming that you can see and hear me. Thank you so much. It is now seven o'clock. I'm going to go ahead and just go ahead and get started as people are coming in. And I'm going to start off with a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, God, for this day. We thank you, God, for this people that are getting ready to chime into this live uh, live Bible study on Facebook. God, I, I ask you today that you let this word that is going forth out of my mouth uh, to be a blessing to somebody, to edify somebody, to uplift somebody, to encourage somebody, to let somebody know Lord, that they're not alone. So I ask you today that you word my mouth, Lord God, that you would touch my mind, and God, that you would give me the anointing, Lord God, as I teach this lesson, Jesus, so that somebody is convicted, somebody is encouraged in the mighty and precious name of Jesus. Let this word go out and let it plant a seed in somebody's life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Just a couple of us on here right now, but um, praise the Lord, Sister Clark. Praise the Lord, everyone on the Bible. Praise the Lord, everybody on the phone line. I'm asking you to please at this time mute your phones as we get started. Please mute your phones. Thank you. Amen. Praise them. I'm asking everyone to please mute your phones at this time. Amen. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, tonight's lesson title is uh, Game of Thrones Part 4. Um, and I promise you this is going to be the last part of the lesson. So if you have not been watching the Game of Thrones uh, Tuesday Night Bible Study series, you can go back to part number one. Part number one, I discussed the battle between the flesh and the spirit, how the flesh and the spirit are constantly at odds. They're constantly warring, warring against each other, and it will remain that day until the day we die. As long as we are in this flesh, we will have struggles. We will have uh, uh, um, pain. We will, we will have um, all kinds of trouble in this life as long as we're in this flesh. Um, even with me teaching this lesson, I, I, I'm going to let you all know I have not uh, apprehended. I have not arrived. I'm not teaching this lesson as a master. Um, I'm also going through the same process that you are going through. I also have to utilize these same tools that I'm teaching you all tonight. So please don't take this to mean that I have somehow mastered my flesh. I have not. Uh, the Bible says that we die daily. We have to crucify our flesh on a daily basis, on a daily basis. Each and every day we find out things about our personality, things about our character, uh, things in our mind that we still have aren't uh, completely crucified, aren't all the way dead. And so we have to each and every day work on killing those things. So that was the first thing I talked about in part number one of Game of Thrones. And the reason why I titled it Game of Thrones is because really this is a, um, a battle. It's a struggle for dominion over your mind. That's why I call it a Game of Thrones. Um, the flesh is trying to take over the throne of your mind so that he can then influence your thoughts and influence your behavior. 
Uh, but the spirit also desires to gain control, complete control over your mind so that he can, uh, can influence your behavior and your thoughts. So that's why I called it and entitled it Game of Thrones. Um, but whoever wins the game, whoever assumes the throne, that's going to be up to you. That's going to be totally up to you, totally your decision. Amen. So I talked about that in part number one. Part number two, I focused on the works of the flesh, I believe. There are 17 works of the flesh. That's a lot of works of the flesh. Um, so we have these constant issues and problems in our flesh that came naturally. We were born this way, okay? We were born. We, this is how we came into the world with all of this stuff. Um, we were born in sin and shaping in iniquity because of the fall of man in Genesis thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago with Adam and Eve because of the fall of man as a result of that as a result of their disobedience now we have to live with uh, natural disasters and with disease and sickness and evil and uh, sin all of that came about as a result of their disobedience in the Garden of Eden and so now this is stuff that we have to live with and um, it, it comes naturally to us. Living evil, living a wicked lifestyle comes naturally to man. You don't have to teach. I was telling uh, in, in, in that Bible study, I, I believe, I was saying you don't have to teach a child to lie. You don't have to teach a child to steal. You don't have to teach a child to uh, be selfish. You don't have to teach a child to be manipulative and conniving. You don't have to, be a, uh, to teach a child to, to sin at all. It just comes naturally to them. It comes naturally to them, like it comes naturally to all of us. And so, but now with the Holy Ghost, what has been downloaded into us is the fruit of the Spirit. And that's what I talked about in part three. That's love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And um, I went over that in part number three. I'm not going to go a whole lot of detail into that in this last part of Game of Thrones, but I will do a little bit of a review. Um, I don't believe I finished all of the fruit of the spirit in the last part. So we'll finish the rest of it tonight and we'll move on. And so that's what I talked about in the first three parts. And so in part number four, um, as I stated before, I'm going to finish talking about the fruit of the spirit. And then we're going to be talking about some other things regarding this battle between our flesh and our spirit. Amen. Um, like I said before, it's going to be a constant battle until the day we die. We're going to continuing. We're going to continue to battle. We're going to continue to battle, but uh, the end result is we don't have to allow our flesh to have the upper hand. Who are you allowing to have the upper hand in your spiritual walk? Who are you allowing to have the upper hand? And the, the, the thing that has the upper hand in your life is the one that's most fed. The thing that will have the upper hand in your life is the one that is most fed. If your spirit is malnourished and has not been nourished with the word of God and you have not been praying or fasting or seeking God as you should, um, but you've been feeding your flesh, not just food, not just talking about physical food. Um, you can feed your flesh in, in many ways. We feed our flesh through uh, the shows that we watch, through the music that we listen to. All of these things feed our flesh. And... Um, as you can as you can tell or as you can notice from what I from those examples, we feed our flesh through our senses. And that's why the Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. Sight is not necessarily talking about eyesight. It's talking about our senses. OK, but it's through our senses that our flesh becomes stimulated through the things that we watch, through the things that we hear, through the things that come out of our mouths, those things are what stimulate our flesh. And so we have to learn to crucify this flesh and we have to learn to build up our spirit man. Now the spirit has power. We're not questioning the ability of the Holy Ghost. The spirit has all power, but it's working with you. The spirit doesn't make you a robot. Um, the spirit is not going to make you uh, 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 live holy unto God. You have to will with the spirit. You have to work along with the spirit. You have to crucify this flesh. You have to agree with the spirit and be intentional about it. Amen. And so let's go ahead and go into this lesson tonight. 
So we left off, I believe, on faith. Faith, one of the fruit of the spirit. Faith, the simple definition of faith is complete trust in, and confidence in God. <clears throat> complete trust and confidence in God. That's the definition of faith. Hebrews 11 and 1 says it like this. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance, the physical, the material, the substance of things hoped for, immaterial, the evidence of things not seen. In other words, that says my faith produces or manifests the things I am currently hoping for. My faith produces and manifests the things that I am currently hoping for. If what you are hoping for is not attached to your faith, then there won't be manifestation. If what you are hoping for, if what you are praying for, if what you are desiring is not attached to your faith in God, then you won't see the manifestation of it. You need faith in order to see the manifestation of those things that you are hoping for. Faith without works is dead. You can't just simply believe, but faith without works is dead. Can't be hoping and praying for a job, but don't fill out any applications. It's not going to work like, like that. It's not going to work that way. You have to work it. You have to work it. And so by working it, I'm not depending on my works to bring about the manifestation of the things that I'm hoping and praying for. I'm not depending on my works. I'm depending on God. I'm depending on God. And I'm believing that by taking the first step, by, by working, by doing something, by doing some action, by showing, uh, uh, showing my faith in action, that God is going to take the rest of it. He's going to take the rest of it. And he's going to manifest the very thing that I've been praying for. Amen. So that's faith. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time uh, on that. Uh, also, the Bible mentions the shield of faith, the shield of faith. That's the only fruit of the spirit that's mentioned as part of the armor. Uh, excuse me. Peace is also uh, mentioned as part of the armor of God. Mm -hmm. All right. So faith, the shield of faith. That's what we need to have as part of our armor. The shield, we all know, uh, blocks. What are we blocking? We're blocking doubt. We're blocking uncertainty. We're blocking fear. We're blocking all of these things that try to get in the way, that try to penetrate our spirit, that try to get in, inside of our minds, that try to influence our behavior. That's what faith blocks. Amen. We're hearing a lot of stuff in the news right now. We're hearing a lot of misinformation about the, the virus, about the disease, about the vaccinations, about this and about that. A lot of stuff is out there. And if you're not careful, listening to that stuff will birth fear in you. Listening to that will birth fear in you. But we don't walk. We don't walk by sight. We don't walk by senses. We walk by faith. I heard a preacher not too long ago say, we have no business as Christians, as faith believers, um, being fearful of the COVID-19 virus and doing what the world does, running and rushing to the store, mm -hmm. buying up the toilet paper and buying up the food and being anxious about what's to come. We have no business reacting that way because we have faith in God. Our trust and our confidence ought to be in God. God has proven himself to you so many other times. Why not have faith in him? Why not trust him again and again and again? But this flesh, it gets in the way. Amen. That's the thing that gets in the way of, of, of us completely trusting and believing in God. But if you crucify the flesh, if you feed your mind the truth, if you feed your mind the word of God, that's what the truth is. If you feed your mind that, that builds up your faith. Faith cometh by hearing and a hearing by or through the word of God. That's how you get faith. That's how you build up your faith. That's how you sustain and maintain your faith. It's through the word of God, mm -hmm. through the word of God. So you ought to be getting into your word. You ought to be reading something so that you can get it into your mind. When you read something and you get it into your mind, it starts forming thoughts. When thoughts form, words come out and form. Pretty soon, the more, the more you get in your word, the more you start reciting and memorizing the word of God, you'll find yourself repeating 
You'll find yourself saying and speaking the word of God and won't even realize it, that you're speaking the word of God. But if it's in you, it's going to come out of you. That's why it's important that you watch what you put in you because whatever you put in you will come out of you. If you're putting junk and mess and rumors and gossip and fear and all of this other stuff in you, then that's what's going to come out. That's what's going to come out in your behavior. That's what's going to come out of your mouth. That's what's going to come out uh, uh, of your words. You're going to uh, repeat whatever you put on the inside of you. So make sure that you put the word of God on the inside of you so that that's what comes out when fear comes, so that that's what comes out when doubt comes, when discouragement comes, that we want the word of God to come out. Amen? So that's faith. And I know we can talk a whole lot about faith, but I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time. Um, the next one is meekness, which is humbleness, humility, humbleness and humility. Matthew 23, verse number 12 says this, For whosoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Let me read that again. Whosoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whosoever humbles himself shall be exalted. The way up is down. The way up is down. If you want to be exalted, if you want to go higher, then you need to come down. Jesus taught us this throughout his entire ministry. Jesus went down his entire ministry. He came to serve. That was his whole ministry, was being a servant. He didn't come to rule with an iron fist. He didn't come to get a following. He didn't come to make people bow down to him. He came to serve. He came to seek those that were lost. He came to get those that were downtrodden, the, the, the forgotten ones, those that were outcasts. He came to get those to save them and to bring them the good news of salvation. That's what Jesus came to do. Jesus went down to the river to be baptized by John. Jesus went down to his knees to wash the disciples' feet. Jesus went down. He kept going down and kept going down until finally when he resurrected and came up out of the grave, he said, all power now belongs to me. All power in heaven and in earth belongs to me. But he had to go down first. We have to learn how to go down. We have to learn uh, uh, not to be so haughty and boastful and prideful and high-minded. We have to learn to humble ourselves before God. That's what Jesus did, and he's our prime example. And so we ought to follow what Jesus did in the scriptures. He went down because that is the way you go up. Let God exalt you. Don't let people exalt you. People tell you all the time, oh, you're so wonderful, you're so this and you're so that, and you can be doing this and you can be going here. You know, you can say, thank you, I appreciate that compliment, but I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm waiting on God to exalt me because when God exalts me, nobody can take me down. If I allow people to exalt me, then they'll have the power to decide whether or not I stay exalted. But if God exalts me, he's gonna keep me there. Amen. So allow God to exalt you. Don't become haughty and high minded and full of pride. Allow God to exalt you. Matthew 18 verses three through four says this. Verily, I say unto you, except ye be converted. This is Jesus talking. Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of God. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. This is Jesus talking right now. Somebody asked him the question, Jesus, now who's the greatest in the kingdom? Who's the greatest? Is it the bishop? Is it the archbishop? Is it the apostle? What about the evangelist? What about the elder? Who, who is considered the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus answered them and said, the servant is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That's the highest aspiration you could ever attain to in the kingdom of God is a servant. If you are a servant, that's as high as you can get. That is the high. And we don't often consider um, servanthood to be a high position, right? Serving others. That's not that's not high to us. Right. We, we want people to serve us. We want quite frankly, you know, it's just nice to be waited on. It's nice for people to to, to come to us and see what we want. But being a servant is the greatest 
the greatest in the kingdom of God. Whosoever shall humble himself as this little child, okay? When God is telling us to, to humble ourselves as a little child or to come as a little child, he's not telling us that we should act or behave as children, that we should be uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, ignorant as, as, as a child. He's talking about we should be uh, developed uh, the humble demeanor of a child. That's what we should do. We should develop a humble, the humble demeanor of a child in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. So that's meekness. The next one, the last one mentioned is temperance. The definition of temperance is emotional restraint or self-control. All right. Emotional restraint or self-control. Now, when I say self-control, that's not necessarily talking about self-will. All right. You cannot live holy. Uh, of your own volition, of your own will, willpower. You cannot live holy by yourself. You need the Holy Ghost in order to live a holy lifestyle. Philippians 2 and 13 says this, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The NIV version says this, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. If you are living holy today, it's only because Jesus is living holy through you. It ain't got nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with you. You don't have the power in your flesh to live a holy lifestyle. The Holy Ghost is the spirit of Christ. Christ was down here on earth. He fulfilled the law, lived up to all the, the, the law and the commandments. He uh, lived this life without sin. He was tempted at all points, yet without sin. He loved people. He, he uh, uh, delivered people and healed people and, and, and all of that too, okay? And that same spirit now resides in you. And that's what's giving you the power to live the lifestyle that you're living, to live holy and righteous before the Lord. It's the spirit of God. It's the Holy Ghost working in you. It has nothing to do with you. All you have to do is yield to the Holy Ghost. That's all you have to do. And the Holy Ghost is doing the work for you, is living this life through you. That's what's enabling you to live holy. If it wasn't for the Holy Ghost, you'd be lost. If it wasn't for the Holy Ghost, you'd be drunk. If it wasn't for the Holy Ghost, you'd be high. If it wasn't for the Holy Ghost, you'd be in somebody's bed. But the Holy Ghost is what gives you the power to live the lifestyle that you're living. And you can't do it without the Holy Ghost. You can't live holy without the Holy Ghost. I don't care how hard you try. You cannot live holy without the Holy Ghost. Amen. And so the, those were all of the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. All right. Now the foundation of this fruit, the foundation of the fruit of the spirit, the foundation of our Christian faith, the foundation, the basis is love. Love is the foundation or the basis from which all the rest of the fruit of the spirit stem from without love. You cannot have joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, etc. Without love, you are nothing. Love is the foundation. Love is the basis. You want me to prove it to you? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, verses 1 through 4. I'm going to read it in your hearing. It says this, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. I gain nothing. Love is what's holding everything together. You need to have love. That has to be your foundation. I'm living in this house right now, but the only reason why it's, it's standing is because it's on a foundation. The only reason why it hasn't toppled over and swayed from side to side is because it's on the foundation. 
and your faith has to be on the foundation of love. Joy and peace and long suffering and all the rest of the fruit of the spirit have to hinge, have to hang on love. Love is the foundation. If you don't have love, you don't have anything. That's what the Bible says. That didn't come from the book of Gregory. That came from the Holy Bible. If you do not have the love of God, the agape love of God, then the unconditional love of God, then you have nothing. You have nothing. If you read on in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, this is what it says. It says, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast, is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not self-seeking. Love is not irritable or resentful. Love does not delight in wrongdoing. Love rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things, hopes all things. Did you catch that? That's all that love is. Let's go back over that. I hope you caught it. Love is patient. Which fruit of the Holy Spirit is that? Long suffering. Love is patient. So long, love is long suffering. Love is kind. Another word for kind is gentleness. That's another fruit of the Spirit. Love does not envy or boast, is not arrogant or rude. What is that? Meekness. That's humbleness. Love is not irritable or resentful. What is that? That's temperance, self-control, discipline. Love does not delight in wrongdoing. What is that? Peace. Love is a peacemaker. Love rejoices with the truth. What is that? That's joy. Love bears all things. What is that? Again, long suffering. Love believes all things, hopes all things. What is that? Faith. So I just tied in love to each of the fruit of the spirit. Love is long suffering. Love is gentle. Love is meek. Love is about being good to others. Love has temperance. Love is peace. Love is joy. Love is faith. So love has to be the foundation. If you do not have the love of Christ, you cannot expect to have all the fruit of the spirit. You've got to have the love of Christ. That has to be your foundation. That has to be the thing on which everything else hinges upon. Everything else depends upon. Everything else stands upon. The Bible says it. it you can speak in all these tongues. You can have all this knowledge and all this education and have a, a, a lot of faith. But if you don't have love, all of that stuff means nothing. All of it means nothing. Amen. Being in the flesh results in slavery, death, and no profit. Being in the flesh, living in the flesh, results in slavery, it results in death, and there's no profit to it. Galatians 5 and 1 says this, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery by the yoke of slavery. Stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. How can you become burdened by the yoke of slavery? By giving in to your flesh. Your flesh causes you to go into slavery. You are a slave to sin. We were once slaves to sin. Amen. We might have felt like we were doing our own thing and living our own lives and just, you know, living it up. But you were actually a slave to your sin, a slave to your addiction, a slave to your bondage. You were a slave. But now that you've received the Holy Ghost, now that you've received the Spirit of Christ, now you no longer have to be a slave. You've con converted from a slave into a servant. Think about it. A slave, there's no profit with slavery. You, you don't get paid to be a slave. Slaves don't get paid. You are a slave to sin. There's no profit to sinning. There's, sin doesn't grow anything. It doesn't produce anything but death. Amen. Galatians 6 and 8 says, Whoever sows to please the flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. I believe that's the NIV version. I believe the Bible says the flesh shall reap 
corruption. Okay, if you sow into this flesh, that's what you reap. You reap corruption. You reap death. You reap soul ties. You reap bondage. You reap depression. You reap anxiety. You reap fear. That's what you reap when you sow to the flesh, when you live in the flesh. Romans 6 and 16 says this. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Okay? I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a slave to sin. I want to be a servant of Christ. Being a slave to sin, is it will get me nothing in the end. It might feel good for a little bit. It might give me some temporary uh, gratification, but in the end, it profits nothing. There's nothing that comes out of living in sin. All right? Only death and damnation. We also know that the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. The results of sin is death. Okay? But the gift of God is eternal life. So choose life today. I'm gonna, not going to read all of the scriptures. I'm just going to reference them. Romans 6 and 23. Romans 7 verses 5 through 6 and verse number 14 as well. Romans 8 and 6 and verse 13. And 1 John 2, 16 through 17. Those are just a few of the scriptures that talk about your flesh. Amen. So just like living in the flesh results in slavery and death, and no profit, living in the spirit results in freedom, life, and fruit. Living in the spirit results in freedom, life, and fruit. St. John 6 and 63 says this, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. This was Jesus talking. The spirit gives life. The Holy Ghost gives life. And the Bible says that uh, he came that we might have life and that more abundantly. Not just talking about eternal life. He wants us to live an abundant life while we're down here on earth. What does an abundant life mean? An abundant life means a life of freedom, a life of wholeness and completeness. That's what abundance means. A life where there's no lack. There's no lack. That's the kind of life that God desires for his children to live. He wants us to live an abundant life. He doesn't want his, us down here broke and disgusted and depressed and full of anxiety and full of carnality. No, that's not life. That's not life. He wants us to live an abundant life. Amen. Romans 8 and 2 says this. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death. The law of the spirit is what gives you life. The law of sin results in death. The law of sin results in guilt, results in condemnation. But the law of the spirit results in life, forgiveness. That's the law of the spirit. Also, I'm going to reference this. I'm not going to read it, but Job chapter number 33, verse number four and Galatians six and eight. You can reference. <clears throat> you can go back and read those scriptures on your own. Amen. And we're almost done. If at any time anybody has any questions about the lesson, please feel free to ask it in the comment section. I see you commenting. I see you participating. Amen. So if you have any questions at all, I'll probably take the last few minutes of this lesson to go over those questions. Amen. All right. So um, what do you do? We're all in the flesh, right? What do you do when um, something comes upon you? you? You encounter something, your flesh starts to rise up, but you want to live in the spirit. You want to abide by the word. You want to live holy. You want to live a holy lifestyle. Let me help you out with that. Um, I'm going to go over a list again of the works of the flesh, along with a fruit of the spirit that you can use to counteract those works of the flesh. 
and not only a fruit of the spirit, but also a piece of the armor that you can put on in order to battle those works of the flesh. And also how you can recondition your mind, what you can think about in order to stay in that mindset. All right. So I'll start off with the first four works of the flesh that are mentioned in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Adultery, fornication, lasciviousness, uncleanness, or impurity. All right? All of those are tied together. There's sexual sin, sexual immorality, sexual lasciviousness, uh, uh, impurity, uncleanness, impure thoughts. All right? When we are encountered with those works of the flesh... The fruit of the spirit that we ought to keep in mind in order to combat those works of the flesh is temperance, that self-control. Again, this is not uh, you controlling your flesh, but this is allowing or yielding to the Holy Spirit in order to live through you, to give you the control that you need so that you don't fall victim to these works of the flesh. I hope that makes sense. It's not about your power. It's not about your self-will. It's not about your... Um, it's not about your, your abilities to withstand, okay? It's about allowing, yielding to the Holy Ghost, nourishing the Holy Ghost, feeding the Holy Ghost so that it becomes a strong influence in you so that you can allow it to live through you and empower you, enable you to, uh, to abstain from all fleshly lusts, to abstain from fornication, to abstain from adultery, to, uh, to abstain from unclean, uncleanness and impurity, to abstain from lasciviousness, to abstain from pornography, to abstain from all of those fleshly desires. The Holy Ghost is what empowers you to do that. And so you need, the fruit of the spirit that you need is temperance in those, in those situations. The armor of God that you ought to put on is the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness is the armor of God that you ought to put on. If you're struggling in your flesh with uh, uh, adultery, with fornication, just can't seem to, to stop sleeping around with people, try to put, learn to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Learn to put on temperance and self-control. Ask the Holy Ghost. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, receive the Holy Ghost. But if you have the Holy Ghost on the inside of you and you still struggle with these things, ask the Holy Ghost to live in you and through you to empower you in order to abstain from those things, to resist the enemy so that he can flee from you. And the thing to think about, recondition your mind on things that are pure. This is according to Philippians 4 and 8. Things that are, that are pure, think on those things because all those works of the flesh have to do with impurity, have to do with uncleanness. But in order to combat them, you have to recondition your mind to think on things that are pure. Amen? And I hope this is making sense so far. Here's the next set of, of works that I want to uh, talk about. Idolatry, sorcery or witchcraft, and heresies. Those are works of the flesh, idolatry, witchcraft, and heresies, all right? Which fruit of the spirit can you use to combat those works of the flesh? Faith. You can use faith in order to combat those works of the flesh. And again, like I said, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But without it, without uh, uh, works, your faith is dead. So there's something, there's some action you have to do. There's something you've got to do in order for this faith to work. Amen? So use faith as a fruit of the Spirit. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Fear also cometh by hearing. The things that we hear, the things that go through our ear gate, uh, 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 produce fear within us. So just like the news can produce fear, the Word can produce faith in you. So the more you dive into the word, the more you put the word on the inside of you, the more your faith grows, the more your, your, your faith is, is cultivated, the more your faith produces. So you have to put the word of God on the inside of you in order for this to work. The armor of God that you ought to put on. There's a few pieces of the armor that you can put on in order to combat idolatry, idol worship, in order to combat witchcraft, in order to combat heresies, false doctrine. That's what that is. In order to combat that, you must put on the armor of God, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the helmet of salvation, and the belt of truth. 
Those are the pieces of the armor that you can use to combat those works of the flesh. What are some of the things that you can think on? Think on those things that are true. Think on those things that are honest and just. Amen? Think on those things. How do you think on those things? How do you think on those things that are true? Well, the word of God is truth. That's what the Bible says. What is truth? The word of God. And so by reading the word of God, by studying the word of God, and by meditating on or thinking on the word of God, that's where we get truth. And that's how you're able to combat false doctrine. If you don't have the word of God in you, anybody can come out, come to you with anything. And you'll start thinking like them. Oh, you know, I don't pray to Jesus. I just, I pray to the universe and I pray to the stars and, and all of that. And it's working for me. And if you're not careful, you'll find yourself doing those same things. You'll find yourself believing that, believing heresies, believing false doctrine. There's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of stuff out there. And just because you see a pastor teaching, uh-oh, just because they're a pastor of a church doesn't mean they're teaching the truth. Doesn't mean that they're teaching the truth which is why you have to have the word on the inside of you to discern what is the truth. You have to have it on the inside of you. You can't just depend on your pastor. Can't just depend on the evangelist. Can't just depend. Love. Love goodness all right um the bible says that it's the goodness of god that draweth men to repentance i didn't repent to god thinking about his judgment thinking about oh Praise you. Thank you. That's how you receive the Holy Ghost. That's how you receive his spirit. That's how he drew me to him is through his goodness, through his love. Amen. And so that's what you use to combat enmity, to combat hatred. You have to be careful that you don't start hating on people. Amen. You, you have to be careful that you don't start developing a spirit of hate. I know there's a lot of racism out there, a lot of ignorant people who say a lot of things and who treat people, uh, 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 who, who, who don't treat people right, especially African-Americans. But you can't allow their treatment of you to, to influence you to hate them back. You can't allow that. You have to keep your mind on the love of God. The love of God, remember, is unconditional. There are no requirements to the love of God. It's not, oh, you love me, then I'll love you back. No, the love of God says, even if you don't love me, even if you don't care anything about me, I choose to love you. I choose to care for you. If you need something, I choose to show up and be there for you. That's the love of God. That's the love of God. Now, the armor of God that you need to put on for this particular work of the flesh, again, is the breastplate of righteousness. What is the breastplate of righteousness? That goes over your torso, right? Covers your chest. What are some of the vital organs that breastplate is, is, is protecting? Your heart. Your heart. That's what it's protecting. It's protecting your heart. <clears throat> it's protecting other organs as well. But your heart is the main organ, the vital organ that that breastplate is protecting. All right? You have to make sure your heart is right. You have to make sure that you don't have hatred and enmity in your heart. Amen? Also, what's one thing that you can think about or what you can condition your mind to think on is things that are lovely, things that are, that are of a good report. Think on those things. The next set of works of the flesh, variance, which is strife, uh, selfish ambition, seditions, dissensions, divisions, okay? The thing that you can use, the fruit of the spirit that you can use to combat those works of the flesh is peace, long suffering, gentleness, patience, peace. That's what you can use to fight off those particular works of the, of, of, of the flesh.
Okay, because we're talking about variance, we're talking about strife, we're talking about divisions and discord and disagreement and, and arguments and stuff like that. Peace is what you can use to fight that off. Long suffering, uh, 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 having tolerance with people, being patient with people, long suffering. God is long suffering to us. We ought to be long suffering to them. We ought to have patience, but oftentimes our patience is short lived. You know, somebody messes messes up messes up and, and does us wrong one time, we cut them off. That's it. One time and done. We might give them one, another chance after that one time. But how many chances has God given you? How long suffering has God been to you? I don't know about you, but for me, I need God's long suffering grace every day. He's long suffering and patient with me each and every day because I'm not finished. Been saved for a while now, but still not finished. Still not finished. And he continues to work on me. He continues to be patient with me when I mess up, when I sin, when I'm in fault. He continues to work on me. He continues to grab my hand and lead me to the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He continues to do that on, on my behalf. Continues. No matter how many times I mess up, no matter how many times I, I've been unfaithful to him, he has stayed with me and never forsaken me. We ought to have that same level of patience with one another. We ought to have that same level of, of long suffering. The armor of God that you need to put on are the shoes shod with the gospel of peace. And the thing that you need to be thinking on to recondition your mind is those things that are of a good report. Those things that are of a good report. A lot of these divisions that we have going Inside the church and outside of the church, a lot of these uh, uh, dissensions and all, all a lot of these uh, uh, disagreements that we have with one another and, and, and we're just divided and we don't talk to them and we don't deal with them and all, all of that um, is over um, a, a lot of times over a false report, over something you heard that wasn't true, over a rumor that was spread, over some gossip, over some just hearsay, over miscommunication, a lot of that stuff. Uh, came about as a result of, of a false report. But when you think on those things that are of a good report, you can keep your mind and your heart from having strife, from having dissensions and, 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 and divisions and seditions. You can keep your mind pure. You can keep your mind in perfect peace. Amen? By thinking on those things that are of good report, somebody brings you a bad report, a false report, you don't have to feed into it. I heard this about so-and-so, and I heard they doing this. And you say, you know what? Um, I'm sorry to hear that. And you know what? I'm going to pray for that individual. I'm going to pray for that individual. And that will stop the conversation right there. As a matter of fact, can we pray right now? Let's let's pray right now for that individual. You know, I know I've been hearing a lot of stuff about him too, but you know what? Let's Let's pray for him instead of talking about him and spreading stuff about him or her. Think on those things that are of a good report. You ought to want to receive good news. But some of us um, love to receive bad news about people, love to receive false reports. Can't wait to hear uh, about something that uh, bad that happened to somebody else. Some of us are like that. But you ought to want to be able to hear a good report, those things that are lovely. Amen. Uh, emulations is another work of the flesh. Emulations, another word for emulations is jealousy. <clears throat> emulations and envy sort of go together. All right. Jealousy is what leads to envy. All right. So in order to combat uh, <clears throat> an envious mindset, in order to combat jealousy, the fruit of the spirit that we need to use is gentleness, meekness, humbleness, being humble. All right. The armor of God, and I'm just about finished, the armor of God that we need to put on is the helmet of salvation. We need to keep our mind right. The helmet of salvation. Amen. And we can think on those things that are just. Think on those things that are right. Think on, on those things that are righteous. Amen. Uh, another set of the works of the flesh is wrath and murders. They go together as well. Wrath and murders. Wrath and murders. The fruit of the spirit that you can use to combat wrath and murder is peace, joy, and temperance. Peace, joy, and temperance. The armor of God that you should be putting on in order to combat wrath and murder is the helmet of salvation. 
A lot of this stuff happens in the mind. It happens in the mind. That's where it starts. This is where it starts. <clears throat> so you have to fight the battle in your mind. You have to keep your mind guarded and protected at all times. Amen. The things that you, that you can think on to combat wrath are things that are pure, things that are lovely. And then finally, we have drunkenness, revelings. All right. The fruit of the spirit that you can use is temperance, which is self-control. Again, let me emphasize, this is not about self-will. This is not about self-discipline necessarily. This is talking about the Holy Ghost working in you and through you in order to give you the power to live a holy lifestyle, in order to give you the power to abstain from the works of the flesh. That is the Holy Ghost working through you. The armor of God that you need to put on is, once again, the breastplate, breastplate of righteousness. And the things that you need to be thinking on to combat thoughts of drunkenness, to combat revelings, is purity. Things that are pure. Amen. That concludes my lesson. I was able to get through it all. Thank you, Jesus. Um, <clears throat> I hope you've enjoyed all of the parts of the Game of Thrones series. You can go back and look at parts one, two, three um, in your leisure if you'd like to. But I want everyone to leave away with this, that we are battling in our minds. We are constantly warring in our minds. The enemy is constantly trying to penetrate our minds, trying to take over our minds, trying to take over our minds, which is why the, the Bible talks so much about guarding your heart, about guarding your mind, about uh, keeping your mind on things that are lovely and pure, about keeping your mind on Christ, about focusing on him, um, because the enemy desires to infiltrate our minds. Because our minds influence our thoughts, our thoughts influence our words, our minds influence our behavior, the things that we do. So my last question to you tonight is, who are you going to allow to have the upper hand in your life? Are you going to allow the flesh to take over your emotions, to take over your will, to take over your thoughts? Or will you allow the spirit to take over your mind? Will you allow the spirit to take over your mind? Who's going to win this game in the end? Who's going to win this game in the end? I thank you all for uh, joining me tonight. I thank you all for being patient with me. Um, <clears throat> please join our uh, prayer line for prayer tonight. The number is 1-720-650-3030. If you have a prayer request, if you have something to lay before God, uh, I encourage you to get on the prayer line at 8 p.m. Uh, Monday through Friday. Monday through Friday. Um, Thank you again for joining me tonight. I hope you were blessed by this. I hope something was said. I hope something was taught uh, to plant a seed on the inside of you, um, to give you the strength to go on uh, during the week, to give you some, some substance, some meat, something to, to feed on um, in order to um, live a life of abundance. That's what God wants for each and every one of us. I'm going to end this uh, Bible study with prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, God. For this lesson, we thank you, God, for everyone that is tuned in. I ask you today, Lord God, that you let this word go forth and do not let it return void. Let it plant a seed in somebody's life and in somebody's spirit and let it grow in due time. And Father God, we'll forever give you all the praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. And I'll see you on the prayer line tonight at 8 o'clock.